Hello? That works. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Awa, and today I'm going to give a presentation about size matters. So just a little bit about myself. I actually used to work at, at Chain Analysis, Chain Analysis as a data scientist. Um, back then, I wrote a couple of papers about applying machine learning to the anonymized Bitcoin. Uh, the papers are still online, pretty interesting. But nowadays, I work on goods for the public, particularly on Anoma and Namada. So why I'm giving this talk, it's because it's been more than five years since I worked at CA. Um, and honestly, even after so long, um, privacy really sucks today. And But the thing is that I actually realized that very few understand why privacy sucks. And this applies to people who build protocols, applications, even cryptographers, and of course, end users. So today, um, I kind of wanted to give you the intuition of why privacy sucks. And I'm going to focus primarily on on-chain privacy. So the first thing framework that I want to share with you is to think like a chain analyst. So first of all, um, there's a misconception around chain analysts being similar as investigators, detectives. Actually, they're not. Um, chain analysts only care about getting coverage, and they care about some probabilistic um, uh, certainty. They don't care about, like, for example, the granularity of identity. They don't care about the specifics of the individuals they are analyzing. And the most important part is that um, really what, they, what success metrics they care about depends on um, why they're doing the analysis for. Some do it for fun, others do it for science, but most do it for profits. And you can actually get paid a lot of money to help other people make money. So you can help with your data traders, investors, um, to ensure that whoever has to pay money pays the money, so compliance. And of course, you can also use this data to help detectives, um, law enforcement, and investigations. And this market has grown a lot over the last years. Nowadays, we even see the centralized toxic marketplaces appearing, like Arkham. But what does a chain analyst do? Um, so it's actually quite simple. You start from a really large data set, large anonymity set, and this can be all the transactions and accounts on Bitcoin, all the transaction accounts on Ethereum. You like download all of that, and you have this dump of every single block. And your goal is to turn this large data set into a very small one. And in the process, you use primarily um, two classes of methods. There are active and passive methods. Um, passive methods are um, simply just analyzing the data you have on chain without uh, interacting with it. So the data you have, you just try to infer and then try to get um, for example, clusters, and they try to reduce the anonymity set just by looking at statistics, transaction graph, um, timing, and so on, and other heuristics. Active methods are more interesting. It is where the chain analyst actually directly interacts with the blockchain and then tries to gain insights that way. And a very simple way of, uh, of an active method is where simply you go and deposit funds to an exchange, for example, and then you track on lines uh, on the on a block explorer and see what's happening. Um, and then also in the process, besides these two classes of methods, you can also combine on-chain and off-chain data. So on-chain data is everything you get from writing a full note. Um, and off-chain data is every other kinds of intelligence that you can gather outside of the blockchain. So this includes social media, the open web, um, and everything else. And once you have all these different methods and all these different kind of data, you can also do, besides reducing anonymity sets, you can also do clustering. So this is about grouping the um, uh, smaller bubbles in the in a smaller set and then try to determine what is it that they're trying to do. So here, for example, um, the cluster two could actually be some kind of WikiLeaks or it could be some kind of commercial activity. That's what I do. Um, and what's interesting as an insight is that when we only had Bitcoin and altcoins, so when everything was just payments and transactions, it was actually harder to tell um, uh, what people were doing because we had to rely a lot more on, on off-chain data to see like what kinds of activities people were doing. But the curious thing is that with the purest of Ethereum and more specifically at a, at, a, at a sediment layer, you actually ended up having even more data on-chain. So the difference is that because they're smart contracts and you can tell what the logic, the logic of the smart contract is transparent, you can actually tell um, what it is for just by looking at what, the, what it does. So the LDR of chain analysis at work is that um, 
it sounds really fancy, but really you take all the data, um, you apply some kinds of statistics, uh, you do some analysis on timing, try to do patterns. Um, if you want to get really fancy, you do then I give the tax. So this is like a method, an active method of uh, fingerprinting. But the sad reality is that in programmable settlement platforms like Ethereum and so on, and um, different, um, well, very popular usages of NFTs, in the end, you actually make the life of a chain analyst really easy, especially if you, on top of it, add in the NFT as a Twitter profile. Yeah, so privacy sucks because anonymity sets are already small. You compare this to traditional finance, compare this to the world of fiat currencies, it is really, really small. On top of it, anonymity sets are actually even smaller because they're fragmented. They're fragmented either by the currency, by an application, or by a platform. So it, it even gets smaller. 99% um, of, of all transactions are still transparent. They're still used, um, there's still interactions on chains that do not support privacy natively. And then that is combined with the increasing amount of data on chain with more NFTs. Um, uh, there are also other kinds of um, applications that just leverage the social graph around NFTs and social media as well. So yeah, when you ask like, okay, in the over last years, we've seen a lot of cryptography being developed and deployed, that is deployed nowadays, like particularly as knowledge proofs, right? And that should just make everything better. But actually that's not true. Um, because first of all, zero knowledge proofs does not equal to privacy. Zero knowledge proofs are a cryptographic scheme that give you some properties, and then some of the properties can be privacy, but sometimes they also use it for succinctness, data verification, and so on. Um, so that a system and an application or protocol uses zero knowledge proofs doesn't necessarily mean that it provides privacy, and it gets more complicated. There are certainly systems that leverage zero knowledge proofs. Zcash is actually one of the best anonymity sets we have today the leverage the knowledge proofs. But even in this case, there are caveats here. Um, the knowledge proofs remove the transaction graph, as in you uh, do not get the information around the sender, receiver, the amount, time, right? But that doesn't equal to there is no data being leaked in the case of Zcash, in the case of any other application that uses the knowledge proofs. So um, uh, Every, every time there's a trans final transaction involved, then it's obvious there's more information being leaked. But even if you look at the box in the middle, even transfers from Z to Z still leak some amount of information. For example, the fee, this is due to how um, shell transactions work. And also you can infer some the statistics, like how what is total volume of shell transactions um, in the network. So, and what's curious is that it seems like very little data, but it's more than enough to really denonymize a big portion of the network. There was a study that was published in 2020 by a few researchers, and what they did is just apply very simple passive methods, a little bit of like active, um, and a little bit of OSINT as well, and they were you managed to actually denonymize nine out of, um, estimated nine out of like 10 transactions in the shielded set. So um, that's not very good for privacy. And active methods I mentioned before are particularly good to de-anonymize um, transactions in the shield set. So the way this works very quickly, because I find it kind of cool, is that you send a really small amount of um, um, to a, an account before it enters the shield set. You fingerprint it, as in the sequence is unique. Um, and you bet on the fact that when this transaction leaves the shield set, you will be able to detect, uh, okay, this was the fingerprint that left, so these two transactions entering and exiting are um, the same entity. So yeah, uh, one takeaway is that most of the data is leaked when a transparent address is involved. So the least data is leaked when interactions remain within the shield set. And the other thing is that users today are multi-chain. Okay, how many of you hold only one, how many of you hold crypto? Let's say, can you raise your hands? Okay, let's say I think around 80% of this room um, uh, holds some crypto. How many of you hold only Ethereum, only Bitcoin, only one kind of asset? Can you raise your hands? Uh, okay, there are you know there are a few still like hardcore maxis respect um, into this multi-chain world, but um, I would safely say that you know the majority of users today hold different kinds of fungible and non-fungible tokens across security domains on Ethereum, um, uh, Bitcoin altcoins, etc., Cosmos, Cosmos-like chains. Um, so actually, privacy is not. Is actually really bad in the case of the cross-chain domain because this is how a transaction looks like when we talk about this is a transaction between Osmosis, an application chain that is a DEX, with Cosmos, another application chain. 
And um, the way this works is there's a protocol called IBC that enables these connections to be done safely and permissionlessly. But you look at this, and to a chain analyst, this just looks like a regular transfer, um, transfer right? So it reveals the entire transaction graph, so not private at all. Even if we were to um, make an interaction between a chain that supports natively um, privacy and a chain that doesn't, in the case of Namara, um, necessarily just by how the, the how IBC and bridges are necessarily des designed, um, it will involve a, a, a transparent address. So like that interaction specifically will be um, transparent. And also, that applies to you when you make the interactions between two chains to support privacy needle. Let's assume that Elio that does private execution VMs um, and Namada, and there's like a bridge um, and there's a transfer, then that actually, that transaction will still be uh, fully legible. So, yeah, the TLDR about cross chain uh, privacy is that it's not very good. It actually just looks like analyzing Bitcoin. So quick question for the audience. Um, more than 80% of the audience raised their hands and held crypto. What do most multi-chain users use today for privacy? Any guesses? What do you use for privacy? I'm not talking about custody, right? I'm talking about like actual, the payment of like when you pay to remain private. Bingo. Centralized exchanges um, is what the majority of people use. And um, uh, as a matter of fact, I do pay a lot of services. I do pay a lot of people in crypto. And for a long time, what I was doing was I self-custodied, right? I bought, for example, some, um, uh, some, some funds from the exchange, and then I funded individual wallets that were um, for each kind of party. So like assume that month I had to do 10 payments, right? Only 10 payments. So what I did was I created a account uh, for every single um, kind of party. And every month that when I had to pay, I was super careful doing every individual transaction, making sure that I was um, not doxing myself and others and just like really, really tedious work. Um, something that should have taken me 30 seconds to complete 10 transactions, right? Not, don't even need the scale of Visa MasterCard. It took me more than an hour every time I had to do it. So this is the sad reality of, um, of today, is just privacy sucks so much that even though we are, as an industry, heading towards decentralization, the sad reality is that um, uh, privacy is so behind that a lot of users actually use centralized um, solutions to get, to get privacy at least from external observers, so on-chain privacy, basically. Um, so yeah, the TLDR is that people who break privacy have a super easy time, and people who want privacy have a really hard life or just give up. So how do we turn the tables around? Uh, to make it really easy for people who want privacy and make it really hard for people who want to break privacy. Um, so the goal is to maximize on-chain privacy. And the takeaway number one is that size matters. What does it mean? Let's do an exercise here. Here are four different anonymity sets, okay? They're all, all of them are shielded sets, so you don't know what's going on inside. From A to D, the only difference is the size. So which one do you think is the hardest to de-anonymize? D? Okay. So actually, it's quite hard to exactly calculate what is like the hardest to de-anonymize, but I think we can get consensus around um, D is significantly harder to de-anonymize than A, right? So the size of the Schiller set actually matters a lot for privacy. So this is the takeaway. The larger the Schiller set, the stronger the privacy guarantees. This, this is really, really important. Takeaway two is remain, remain within the shielded set. This means that, um, as a reminder of what happened before, um, especially in the case of Zcash, what happens a lot is that even when there is so much proofs involved and everything, um, users tend to transfer in the shielded set and then leave. There might be a reason why they wanted to do that. They might want to use those funds elsewhere for an application, so on, like that. But actually, if you do that, um, uh, it's completely pointless that you actually went to shielded set to begin with because there's just no privacy if you do that. Um, and actually, you just get much stronger privacy guarantees if you just remain within the shield set. And takeaway number three is we need to boost privacy through UX. And um, to be fair, when we talk about, oh yeah, privacy hasn't been adopted because UX sucks, actually, that is 
not the right framework to think about it. Um, I think most of the UX that is required to make privacy um, accessible for a lot of people, it comes from the restrictions from the design of the protocol. Um, but once you have achieved the, you know, the size part, once you have achieved like the ability to, to remove the need for users to leave the shield that's set, then comes something else that can easily improve about 100x privacy just by default, right? And here's an exercise of how you can do this. And I'm talking about not protocol features anymore. I'm talking about just interfaces. So here are four shield sets. Um, shield set A is just a very small one. It has a size of one. There's one type of assets inside of shield set. Um, and then this is a user, a very naive user, that sends one ETH and it sends it out immediately. So like T is one. And then the other extreme is where all variables are infinite, as large as possible when it applies, and are randomized. So I'm talking about shield set T where we have a really large set, and there are, within the set, a lot of different kinds of assets. Um, and the question here is, which one is harder to anonymize, assuming that the difference between A and D is the size as well, but also we randomize values um, when it flows out, we randomize times as well, and we also randomize the asset. So this is just a way of thinking about a lot of things you can do just at the end user interface level that can just by default um, uh, defend you against active methods, pass passive methods, and just by default give you a lot more privacy, even to the user who doesn't really understand what's going on. So yeah, this is where we are today. And the goal is to get to making it really hard for people who want to break privacy. And just the last takeaway is that, and this remind ourselves that we're building privacy tech for everyone and not just for cypherpunks. And yeah, we have figured this out, how we do this, you can check it out later. Um, and there's an entire article about size matters. You can take a look, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I think we can have uh, one or two questions uh, for, for the presentation and the talk. Does anyone have a question? Okay, again, thank you.